Hello everybody, hope you're doing marvellously well. We're big, we're bad, and we're back with another FAC Friday. So I hope you've had a lovely week thus far. We've got some great questions for you. Please hit the like button, share, and of course you can go to producelikeapro.com and sign up for the email list and get a whole bunch of really wonderful free gifts. There's multi-tracks, there's samples, there's free lessons, all kinds of fun stuff. So please go to producelikeapro.com. I'm learning recording and mixing with internet tutorials at home, but I will probably never have a formal degree or anything. Will I ever get to a point where I can refer to myself as a recording slash mixing engineer without a degree? How do I know when I'm skilled enough for that? How will you know? That's, that's, a, that's a great way to ask the last part of the question. All of the best producers and engineers and mixers, the ones that I admire, the ones that when you listen to their work, you're just blown away. None of those guys and girls would ever say that they are experts or professionals or at the top of their game. You talk to Bob Clearmountain, inarguably the greatest mixer, just all of my favorite mixers, favorite mixer. When I met him and did that really long interview with him, we spent a whole day with him, it was wonderful. I said to him, you do realize everybody references your mixes, particularly Woman in Chains. We love that mix, it's so wide, it's got so much depth, the panning stuff you do, the effects is incredible. And he went, really? People reference that? And I'm like, my head exploded. I was like, yes, I've sat in the room with 20 different mixers that have as a reference track. I've never heard him describe himself as anything other than a mixer. He's never put the words, you know, great at this or sound of anything. He is the definition of humility. When you get to talk to the great engineers, the great producers like Jack Douglas or Jay Messina or Roy Sakala, God rest his soul, Shelley Yakis, the guys that made, that made the records that we all admire, none of them want to be called professionals. None of them went to any kind of music school. They didn't go to learn how to engineer, they didn't go learn how to mix or anything. A lot of them had on the job training, of course they did, they worked in studios, but not everybody. Some of my favorite producers was a bass player in an incredible band and then becomes a producer. It's lots of musicians become producers and engineers that maybe have recorded in studios as a musician and thought, I want to do this. But they didn't go to school. They didn't shadow anybody. Obviously, if you get that opportunity to shadow an incredible producer and engineer, take it. That's a wonderful opportunity. But the reason why I'm going on about this is I didn't get to do any of those things. My journey was two cassette players. One of them was built into my dad's home hi-fi and the other one was a Philips cassette player. And I remember when I asked this question on Instagram, you know, a few months ago, many people answered that this was also how they started. So what I would do is I'd play guitar on and record it onto the little cassette player and take that cassette player out and put it in the home hi-fi, press play, and then do the overdub really badly, really primitively, on a second cassette on back in the Philips cassette player. So you understand the process, you know. So one was playing back through the hi-fi speakers and the other one was recording the new guitar and the overdub from the speakers. And you do this like four or five times and I tried to build up Brian May harmonies. I really had a terrible understanding of harmonies. All I knew was one, one scale, first position, pentatonic minor blues scale. So, you know, as you can tell, the harmonies were pretty primitive, but that was, that was what I did. And obviously by the end of it, it was mainly hiss, but that's how I got started. And I didn't have a four track for the longest time because I didn't have any money, but a couple of my friends had the very first four tracks, like the Porter One, I think I had a Porter Two that I got to play with. Remember the Fostex, I think it was called the X15. You know, I got to play with these things, but I didn't own one. But then I was blessed to go and work with other people that had recording devices. I would go and uh, do overdubs on, I think the first kind of reel-to-reel -reel four track I ever saw. It wasn't a J37, it wasn't like this incredible machine. It was just a very primitive Fostex or Tascam. The first time I remember really feeling like 
wow, we're moving up in the world, was going to a studio and tracking on an MSR24, which was a one inch 24 track. And then the studio I ended up working at briefly, a studio close to my hometown, it was another village away, and they had an MSR24, and that was incredible. When I moved to Los Angeles, I started using ADATs, and I had a Soundtrax Topaz console and a single ADAT, eight track, and then I bought a second one, and I started recording bands in my um, apartment, in my flat in uh, Silver Lake in Los Angeles. And that was sort of the beginning. I expanded that and, you know, started learning Pro Tools and, you know, on a Mix Plus system. Well, actually it was a D24, then a Mix Plus system was the first system I bought. Then I bought an HD, et cetera, et cetera. And so my point is, is I didn't have any kind of formal training whatsoever. And if you look around this room and you see like a, you know, an SSL console behind me and Poltex and Golden Platinum Records and uh, Genelex and Focals and all this nice stuff. You know, I got 99% of this from making music and buying gear. I didn't, you know, these weren't given to me. If you go back to my earliest videos on YouTube, like go back to like one of the first ones, I think it's called Mixing Vocals to Sit in the Mix Properly. If you go back to that video, it's pretty much the same gear. There's, well, I think we put the records up more recently than that, but essentially there was a pair of NS10s and the Genel X. But you know, I, I, I got to this point from making music. So this is why I'm so passionate and why I love that question, because it's reiterating something that's very important to me. Creativity, it really is king. It is not something to play lip service to. Um, it's not a clickbait. If we, if we make the title of this video, Creativity is King, it's not gonna get any more views. If we do a little, you know, emoji of me wearing a crown and like, Creativity is King, it's, it's, not, it, it, it's not a clickbait kind of title. The reality is, is it really is creativity that is King. When I think of all the albums I like and the music I like, I'm sure you do too, I can put on A Night at the Opera, as you know, and just lose it on just how incredible the production is and the songwriting and the performance. But I can also put on Raw Power by Iggy Pop and the Stooges and just love it, how bad it is in a really, really exciting way. How the lead guitar in Search and Destroy just blows your head off. Um, I can listen to Black Sabbath's first record, one of my favorite albums ever, which I was doing probably 20 minutes ago before we started this video. All of it makes sense to me. I can listen to Mozart, definitely listen to Beethoven. I can listen to Miles Davis, Kind of Blue. I can listen to Coltrane, Giant Steps, Love Supreme, all of the great music in the world that we all love. And modern music as well. I particularly love early, mid 90s, you know, uh, Massive Attack, Porter's Head. I love that kind of stuff. The point is, is like there's great music being made now and there was great music being made at the earliest possible time of recording and everywhere in between and before and after and whatever. It's not about being an expert in anything. Learn these techniques, whether you get them online, whether you get them from looking over somebody's sh shoulder, whether you get to be in a studio and hang out with some incredibly talented people, no matter where you learn, just learn and pick it up. So don't feel less than because somebody went to a, a pay school or a university or whatever it was that they did, or even somebody that worked in a studio for 20 years. These are all wonderful things that you can learn from. You can learn from these people. But at the end of the day, nobody buys a record because of those things. Nobody streams a record because of those things. One of the first videos I ever did was with Jack Douglas and he he said to me, why do you call it Produce Like a Pro? I was like, well, because every channel, all they do is talk about mixing. And there's brand new channels bringing up every day talking about mixing, 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 mixing. Nobody ever talks about production or recording. They only make it about mixing. There's whole businesses run on mixing. And obviously coming up as an engineer and a producer 
and a musician. It was all about writing the part and getting the right guitar sound and, and uh, writing the lyric and working with the singer on, on the delivery of it. All of these things were huge. The last thing I thought about was like the mix. Nobody in a rehearsal room, nobody writing a song in a room is thinking about the mix. Think about that. But all you hear talked about, every single person on YouTube, mix, 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 mix. Yeah, mixing is important. Mastering is important. They're very important things. But the song better be really, really good. And hopefully it was recorded by somebody who didn't mess it up, who captured the right performances and knew how to preserve what was great about it and not remove the essence of, of the song. And then the mix, at its best, should be enhancing what's great about the song. This idea that somebody's gonna mix the song and make it like this massive smash hit. So much of the music that we admire, that we put on these huge pedestals, a lot of it was recorded at a time when there was no mixer. It was just the engineer and the producer making the record with the band. And then maybe the mix was done in pretty much the most minimal amount of time. And again, I'm not gonna make it about like old bands versus new versus middle period, because all that is irrelevant. I don't ever get into that stuff because good music has been made forever. It continues to be made. It was made five years ago, 10 years ago, 15, 20. There is no one thing that I hold up as being any better than anything else. The only thing I will ever attest to is incredible songs with incredible performances. Those are the most important things. So, getting back to your question. Don't ever feel less than. All you have to be is an incredible creative and have the ability to be able to communicate and listen to the artists you're working with and you will do well in this business. I'll say it one more time. All you have to be is a really incredible creative who has great communication skills, who knows how to support the artists they're working with, bring the best out of them. Know, as Dave Jordan, the great Dave Jordan said, two skills. First skill is knowing how to like rewrite the song if necessary, change the key, speed it up, slow it down, start from scratch, whatever. And then the second most important skill, which is probably the biggest. Know when to get out of the way of the artist and just help them make a great record. And a lot of people I've worked with over the years, the ones that I admire, that's the biggest skill they have. And the ones that drove me nuts and I didn't get the great recordings out of when I was an artist were the people that felt like they had to have an opinion about everything and impose their opinion and their will. Why work with an artist if you're just gonna to dictate to them? You need to empower them and bring it out. So your biggest skills and all you should be concerned about is being an amazing creative and knowing how to communicate and get the best out of artists. Everything else, degrees, PhDs, whatever, those are nice to have. And if you ever wanna go into teaching, having a PhD means you can be a professor of music and that's fantastic. I have many friends that are professors. That's absolutely amazing. But all of them, all of the good ones, I might add, would never put themselves on some kind of pedestal just because they have a PhD. They wouldn't. They would still be fans of guys and girls that wrote massive hit songs when they were teenagers, that came from poor backgrounds or middle class or whatever backgrounds. It's a big talking point. I love talking about this stuff and it's really important to me. You never feel less than just because somebody has some, even just the awards, any of that, just don't feel, don't ever feel less than because the great public will decide whether they like the music you make or not. Not the professors, not the experts. I've heard that distorted guitars don't need compression. Is that true? Yes and no. The yes part is if you've got a massively heavily distorted guitar, like a wall of just guitar sound, actually using compression on that will probably make it sound smaller, if anything. However, if you're doing a crunchy, driven guitar that's got like a little bit of grind to it, you know, you dig in deep and it starts to distort more, or you play really softly, it's quite clean. 
that's really kind of nice to get a couple of dB worth of compression on it. And 1176, either the hardware or the software, is a really, really nice sound on that kind of crunchy guitar. So I would say it really depends on one thing and one thing alone, how much distortion, because the distortion itself is giving you that massive amount of compression. So if you have an absolutely massively high gained signal, compression is not gonna help. If anything, as I was repeating myself, it's gonna make it sound smaller. But if you've got something which has got quite a lot of dynamics from very clean on a performance to really heavy dig in distortion, that's quite nice with compression on it. I do that all the time. I'll use either 1176 or my Spectrasonics to get a little bit of compression on that kind of crunchier guitar tone. In what order do you track instruments? For example, do you always track drums before bass to provide the feel, or are there no rules? Depends on the song and the genre. Song first is the most important thing. If I'm working with a solo artist that's an acoustic guitar player or piano player, we will sit in this room and we'll trade song ideas. They will sit play their acoustic or their piano, we'll set them up there. We'd put a microphone in the room, capturing all of the ideas that we have and I will work with them on the arrangement and the timing and the key and all the things that you have to do. And when it gets to that point that we're, we're happy with everything, we think we've got the tempo, arrangement, key, everything down, I will 99.9% .9 of the time just go, hey, will you just go run in there and put that down, you know, while we're here? We'll run the click track or not run the click track if we don't wanna use a click track, and they will put down the idea. And then I'll be like, you know what, would you, would you sing that? Uh, one of the things that I do is I'll get the artist to sing and play the acoustic guitar and the vocal or the piano and the vocal live together. And then I'll say to them, you know what, I like that. Once it, so if it feels good, and usually it does feel good when they've just gone in there. I'll be like, you know, just because we're in there and you're recording, play a double of the piano or a double of the acoustic to that take. And so they'll play a double to it so it has that, maintains that same feel, that same groove that you've just worked on and captured. And then I'll be like, you know what? I like that. Let's mute the original scratch acoustic and vocal and just do a vocal over that acoustic. And then they'll sing over the acoustic or over the piano track, whatever we've done. And sometimes they're so in the zone, we've been working on the song, Next thing that springs to my mind is I lean in and I go into the tour back and I go, that was a, that was a pretty, pretty darn good vocal. And, and I really believe you because you're in the moment and we just finished working on the lyrics and I really believe what you're doing. So give me, a, give me another couple of takes and they'll do a couple more takes, at least 50% of the time, quite frankly. That becomes the vocal. And the acoustic guitar part or the piano part becomes the acoustic guitar or the piano part that we start tracking to. So when you ask that question, yes, I may then bring in a drummer, but I found the fundamental thing that drives the song, the instrument that the song was written around. Now, here's an important thing to think. Pass me uh, that electric guitar, please, Eric. Quite often when people are writing and they're a guitar player or a piano player, for instance, but using the guitar, there is a connection between the rhythm that they play and the way they sing. So there might be. So they may sing the melody rhythmically might match the guitar or it might push against it. Even if you mute that original guitar part or the original piano part and choose to use other instruments. There's something in that groove or that swing, and it doesn't have to groove or swing, but there just might be something in it that makes that vocal work, that makes that instrument work. So quite often, I'll mute the acoustic, I'll mute the piano. It might be what we build the whole song around and we maintain it. It might be what we build a song around and we mute it, but ultimately, it is usually what the song becomes built around. So doing the drums next is a distinct possibility, but it doesn't have to be next. Quite a lot of the times I'll take the piano or I'll take the acoustic and I'll think to myself, hmm, there's a part that I like off of that. I am totally free and love the idea of just 
building the song in any way that feels right. So if you're a multi-instrumentalist or you're working with a band and you have musicians at your disposal and you hear a part, and it's not the drums, but you hear a part and you think it will really, really help, go put it down. Go put that part down. And it has happened, not as often, but does happen quite a few times. The last instrument I put on, or one of the last instruments, is the drums. Because I build the song up and I've got it to feel really, really good, and the only thing I feel like it's lacking is a really straightforward drum groove against it. My point is, is like the song will take you in the right direction. And if you're not sure what that is, feel free to experiment. But quite often, having a drummer play to a click track and then building from that, there's gonna be no groove or swing. Again, maybe it doesn't need groove or swing. Maybe it's a prog metal song and it's just like math rock. I get it. That's a whole different world. That's what I'm saying about the song and the genre. If you are doing something like super math rockish, you might want to do something you can chop up and, and really go to town on. But with many solo artists and even many bands, you want to find the essence of the song. And if the singer and the guitar player, for instance, write the songs together, get the guitar player to play with the singer singing together. Get the scratch track of them performing together. The guitar player will play off the singer, the singer will play off the guitarist. And before you know it, you will have an essence of a song that you love put down? It's a great, great question. The rules are there are no rules, but for me, it's about finding the essence of the song and trying to capture it pretty soon. So if I'm working on the song, even if it's just brief pre-production before going and record, I try to get them in the zone, get the arrangement and the keys and the tempos and everything the way we want, and then send them in and capture it while we're in that zone. All right. Have a marvelous time recording and mixing. Thank you ever so much for another wonderful Fact Friday. Great, great questions. Leave a bunch of comments and questions below. This is where we get all of our Fact Friday questions from. Have a marvelous time recording and mixing. Oh, and don't forget to go to producelikeapro.com and sign up for the email list and you can get a whole bunch of free goodies. Speak to you all again very, very soon.